Hello, I'm Brett Stevens, CEO and co-founder here at FOST. I'd like to welcome everybody to the first ever virtual masterclass streaming live from our HQ here in Las Vegas. I hope that everybody enjoys the class today. And again, welcome to the future of horticulture, science, and engineering. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to our Cultivator Masterclass. I'm Anthony Domain. Today we'll be covering seven different tips for using high-intensity LEDs in a cannabis cultivation setting. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a cultivator liaison and a social media coordinator here at FOS. Um, as a cultivator liaison, I help our clients get dialed in with their fixtures. And as a social media coordinator, I uh, have my hand in online marketing as well. Um, outside of that, I'm a passionate horticulturist. I love growing leafy greens, uh, veggies, fruiting trees, all kinds of plants. Um, I've been in cannabis cultivation for about six years, um, two years commercially. Um, spent a lot of time as a, a flower room lead, managing upwards of 2,000 plants um, at any given time, so about 160 lights for perspective. And I've also been a post-harvest manager uh, responsible for QCing the whole post-harvest process from dry and cure to trim and packaging. So just a little bit about me. A um, little bit about FOS. Uh, FOS is the future of horticulture science and engineering. Uh, we're the leading manufacturer of high performance LEDs designed for cannabis cultivation. Um, our sole focus is to enable growers to attain previously unthinkable or unattainable results. Uh, in some cases, increasing productivity upwards of 30 to 60%. So our unwavering commitment to advancing technology and finding more efficient and sustainable solutions uh, has made us a real game changer for both home growers and cult uh, commercial cultivators alike. Um, so just again, at FOS, we prize the ability to look beyond convention and we're looking toward the future. So uh, just before we get started as well, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we've provided you a, ver a PDF through your email to take notes. And if you have any questions at any time during the, the presentation, feel free to ask them. Uh, we'll likely get to them at the end of the, the presentation. 
Okay, so high intensity LEDs, they are far from being an easy plug and play situation in the grow room, especially if you run systems like HID. Um, cultivators need to account for a lot of different variables, uh, whether it's defoliation, environmental parameters, um, feed ECs, when you do uh, utilize these systems. So um, all these various factors play critical roles in plant morphology and yield and in how potent your product is gonna end up being. So light being one of the, the biggest drivers of photosynthesis, um, it can make for a pretty decent learning curve uh, whenever you implement systems like FOS. So growers have to learn to adapt regardless of their experience level and uh, reconsider the different variables that they might need to monitor when switching to these lights. All right, so first up uh, among these seven tips is gonna be adjusting your environment. And if you come from HID systems, uh, the first big difference is that we don't have uh, all of the heat that HID systems produce. Um, LEDs are able to operate at much cooler temperatures um, and that heat from HID systems, it ends up stressing your AC out, um, which really is, is kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. AC systems aren't designed for horticulture application anyway. So to add the additional heat after, uh, you know, the system's not really made for horticulture anyway, it, it tends to get really difficult and costly for your utility, utilities. So high quality LEDs like FOS, we produce less heat. Um, and in turn, you're gonna have to compensate for that whenever you switch to LEDs in your grow room. So oftentimes a lot of HID guys are um, shooting for that 75 degree target set point in order to reach a good leaf surface temperature. Um, and in order to achieve that under LEDs, you're going to need to run your room temps a lot warmer. Anywhere from seven to 10 degrees is a good gauge for on average. Um, Keep in mind though that now that your, your room is a lot cooler, uh, your AC will be working less, which is both good, but it presents the, uh, the additional need for dehumidification. So under HID systems, your AC is working really hard and providing some supplemental dehumidification. And when we remove that, that AC need, you're going to have to supplement with additional dehumidifiers. Um, an additional parameter that you're going to need to adjust is CO2. So as you are increasing light levels, CO2 should increase uh, with that. And especially as you taper at the end, taper your CO2 as well. Uh, but main takeaways from this section again is that LEDs operate a lot cooler, so you'll need to run your rooms warmer. Um, additionally, you'll need to supplement dehumidification, uh, whether that's a Quest or an Andon unit, just something to, uh, to fulfill that need in your grow space. And then adding CO2 is also very important for driving photosynthesis. So second point here is pushing higher light intensities. So pushing higher intensities just isn't really possible under older model or um, low quality LEDs and especially under HID systems. And additionally, the photon distribution is not that uniform. So, um, that being said, with LEDs, you have the ability to push higher intensities early, but is that good for your grow room? Um, it's, it's been recommended uh, for a long time to push for that 350 micromole to 700 micromole target for veg. Um, but studies have shown that we can push even higher and it can be to the benefit of the plant. So a 2022 study from the Journal of Industrial Crops and Products stated that um, light intensities between 600 and 900 micromoles are extremely beneficial for pushing production early in the veg. Um, the higher side of that being more beneficial than the lower side. So what they found is that 900 micromoles produced shorter, more compact plants. It also produced shorter internodal space on the plants that receive that light. And then comparatively, the plants under 600 micromoles uh, were a lot stretchier as far as plant height and also the internodal spacing was a lot greater. So case in point, um, higher light intensities early are a very good thing. 
but you just have to ensure that the rest of your parameters are balanced to meet the needs of those higher intensities. Um, subsequently, intensity plays a huge role in the flowering stage. So there have been some studies conducted showing that there's a linear increase in yield and potency through 1800 PPFD in many drug type cultivars. So this means that a lot of cultivators are currently leaving money on the table, whether it's in the form of weight or potency, um, there's more to be desired. Uh, so pushing higher intensities early is super important. Um, additionally, light intensity can be used to modulate your, your plant structure, like I mentioned earlier. So um, if you have a cultivar that's very stretchy on its own, running those higher light intensities can help mitigate that stretch. And conversely, if you have something that uh, it doesn't stretch up very tall, running lower light intensities might give you a little bit more plant height. So intensity can, key takeaways here are intensity can promote a better veg plants as far as structure goes. Um, it can promote higher flower yield and higher potencies in many cultivars. Um, but I will say that as a disclaimer, some cultivars just have their genetic predispositions and a lot of cultivars still just prefer lower light no matter what. Um, it's largely in part to their parental lineage and the system they're selected under. Um, so growers should keep this in mind as they're running various strains under high PPFD that some will just always prefer the lower end of the spectrum. Okay, so point three here is uh, we're gonna be running higher inflow and substrate ECs. So under HID systems, a lot of light intensities are lower than LEDs on average. Uh, they'll peak between 700 and 1,000 micromoles. Um, HID systems can produce a little bit of a higher micromole value, but there is a con. Whenever you go past 1,000, you'll start to just really have some detrimental heat load to your canopy. So as you switch to more high intensity LED fixtures, more usable light can be distributed at the plant canopy. Um, and if uh, more light is distributed, it's gonna drive photosynthesis more so, or want to at least. So in order to balance that, we will have to increase both our feed and our substrate ECs. Um, we've seen a lot of success between uh, the range of 2.5 to a 4.0 EC. Uh, for those on a PPM scale, that's roughly 1,250 parts per, uh, parts per million to 2,000 parts per million. Um, and these are really dynamic tools as well to control both your feed and substrate EC because these have a huge role in plant morphology also. Um, if you are running uh, higher ECs, you're likely going to see more generative growth. If you have lower ECs, you're going to see a lot more vegetative growth. But um, you know, it's all about balancing the parameters uh, according to your goals because everybody's facility is different. Um, and additionally, just to show how dynamic EC can be as a tool, you can stack your EC within your substrate using different feed ECs. So for example, uh, running a 2.5 feed EC uh, with less runoff can give you the same substrate results that running a 4.0 EC with more runoff can. So it really all just depends on what each grower wants to do and how it'll best optimize their crop, but there's a lot of different strategies and methods that you can take when it comes to fertigation. Generally speaking though, like I said, we're gonna to wanna to stay between the 2.5 to 4 EC range. All right, so the next uh, tip is utilize the correct spectrum. So HID growers uh, have largely used CMH bulbs uh, during the veg period due to the fraction of blues that it will deliver. Uh, blues have been known to be really good for mitigating plant height and stacking up nodes in cannabis. Uh, additionally, um, there's a con to that. So high levels of blue too late can result in lesser yields and potentially lesser potencies as well. So 
Typically what HID growers will do is they'll swap for a high pressure sodium bulb during flower or do sort of a mixed like combination of CMH and HPS. Um, but the HPS brings more of the yellow, oranges, reds, far reds um, that are beneficial to flowering. So changing these bulbs can, one, they can be dangerous. Um, Two, they're, they're a labor hassle for cultivators. And the lifespan of these bulbs makes for a constant need to change these. So a lot of cultivators are starting to opt for LEDs that can change the spectrum uh, within one fixture to avoid this process. Uh, so spectrum, if uh, it can control plant morphology as well, and it's a lot of these factors are able to do that, but they all work in tandem together and if optimized can make some pretty crazy results. So uh, FOS has designed our flagship series with three different spectral settings, spring, summer, and fall, to sort of mimic uh, what happens outdoors. The spring setting is really great for veg and it's great for early flower as well to mitigate stretching due to the high blue fraction in it. Um, our summer setting is best utilized mid-flower. Um, it has a little bit more uh, red, orange, yellow hues. And then subsequently we have the autumn feature for ripening. But it's important to note that spectrum can either stunt growth or promote it based upon when you use a given spectrum. So uh, utilizing improper spectrums for the wrong stage of life is just gonna give you non-ideal results and likely lesser yields at the end of the day. So key takeaways again, spectrum is huge for plant morphology, yield and potency as well. So catering to each phase of life is going to be key with, um, with cultivation. All right, uh, the next one is ramping intensity. So this is something that if you're converting from an HID system is, uh, is something you don't have a lot of control over. Um, some systems just turn off and on. Other systems can ramp in 25% increments, but as the plant perceives it, this can be a really drastic change. So um, FOS developed a central control model to allow growers to ramp intensities by 1% increments. And uh, this eliminates the need to chase the canopy, which is another method of uh, meeting the PAR needs that HID growers used to implement. It's a laborious task to manually lift the lights, or even if you have an automated system, the, the systems are costly. So um, where FOS comes in is we provide the power and the, the ramping ability needed uh, to just set and forget your lights and, and just control intensity via our control module. Um, this can be extremely beneficial for people growing under these systems for the first time because high intensity LEDs drive photosynthesis very quickly and very rapidly. So if you're not ready to meet uh, the other parameter needs in order to drive photosynthesis, then you're gonna see some problems under high intensity. So um, slowly pushing cultivars uh, early in, uh, forgive me, Slowly pushing cultivars, uh, especially if they're a new cultivar to your facility, um, is, is super key. You wanna know where the parameters are as far as light intensity and how it responds to the feed that you're giving. Um, and you can't do that if you just jump 25% increments or from off to on. So um, utilizing uh, some sort of intensity control is key for just dialing in each crop. Um, additionally, I will say many cultivars have been bred and selected under HIDs. So uh, that's another reason to take increases very slowly to see which can handle um, advanced light levels under LED and which can only perform at those lower light intensities that it was selected under. So um, the next section here is dimming lights after defoliation. And defoliation happens many ways uh, from home grower to the commercial side of things. Some people will do one intensive defoliation. Others can do multiple throughout the flower cycle. Some people are constantly defoliating, but 
regardless of when you do it, you should keep in mind how heavy your defoliation is and keep that in tandem with your light levels and your total irrigation volume. So as you are taking away, let's say 20 to 30% uh, biomass, um, you're going to need to drop your intensity 20 to 30%. Uh, plants are gonna be transpiring a lot less with, uh, with less foliage. So that's, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, additionally, just wanted to remind everyone, uh, if you haven't already, please submit all your questions. Uh, we'll get to them at the end during our Q&A session. Um, but to continue on here, um, like I said, fan leaves work in tandem with light to drive photosynthesis. And when we remove that, it not only stresses the plant, but it decreases their capacity to photosynthesize. So um, it's important to dim the light fixture and alter your irrigation uh, program to avoid burning your crop or have any other nutritional issues. All right, so lastly, we have dropping temperatures at the end of the cycle. So a 2011 study has shown that cannabis varieties prefer certain climates um, as their response to environment determines their cannabinoid concentrations, color changes, and how, how well they photosynthesize. Um, variations in response to temperature are really they're very widespread with both drug and fiber type, can fiber type cannabis. Um, so for example, you know, just within cultivars that are cultivated in the medical and recreational arena, um, you can have the same parent and it can take different traits from, from the other parent and they both perform differently in the grow. So there are a lot of variances when it comes to that as it pertains to how dropping temperatures is going to affect the, the bud's color. Um, some things you can do uh, to, to benefit your crop at the end is increasing your daytime and nighttime differential. Um, this is gonna bring out a lot of the anthocyanin expressions in the flower, making them more purple, pink, and giving them that nice fade uh, that you, you see traditionally in late flower. Um, and this additionally, this is going to mimic the naturally occurring temperature drops that we see outside toward the end of uh, the outdoor season. So each cultivar is gonna have unique colors revealed in lower temperatures. Uh, they vary really greatly. Um, and concerning environmental pr uh, preferences and varying genetics, dropping temperatures at the end of the cycle typically affects, or typically affects the the color of cannabis flowers. Um, one thing to keep in mind is as temperatures drop, you wanna ensure that your humidity is altered to maintain a proper VPD. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and additionally, um, you know, if you were previously under HID and running that 75 uh, degree Fahrenheit set point, um, your leaf surface temperature is gonna be a little bit warmer. Uh, under LEDs, if your room is at 82, your ambient is going to be very close to that. So um, one thing to keep in mind is if you want to get those same expressions you're getting out of your HID system that you will need to drop temps at the end of the cycle to induce those colors. Um, you'll also want to decrease water content a little bit within the substrate as well. As cannabis gets to the end of its life, it naturally starts to uh, draw up less water. Um, and with the addition of cooler temperatures, it's going to, to drink a little less as well. All right, now that being said, I will open up the floor for the Q&A session. Mike, what do you have for me? First question we've got is, <clears throat> do you have a recommended CO2 target for peak flower? At 900 GMO, can you go over the recommendations if that was more geared towards veg or just how we tie in uh, CO2 to what levels you can like? Yeah, certainly. So um, Mike just mentioned uh, CO2 targets that, that we might be looking for at a 900 uh, micromole value. Um, one, just to reiterate, that value uh, was suggested for the vegetative cycle. Um, but with increasing light 
levels, you are going to want to increase your CO2. So if you're hitting levels upwards of 12 to 1500 micromoles, you can push your CO2 upwards of 15 to 1600 parts per million. Um, at those lower values, you could probably go about 900 to 1000 as well on the, the CO2 parts per million. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've used a few different companies uh, pushing high ECs and under high light. One of them being the Athena line, which is pretty common. Uh, additionally, I've done some work with, um, with JR Crop Tech. Um, now, really, what I've noticed is when you're pushing higher ECs, you just want to ensure that you have a balanced nutrient blend. Because if you're, if certain mineral elements are are off, it's going to result in um, nutrient deficiencies and lockouts that you don't understand, especially without stuff like plant sap analysis. So, um, for example, you know you could have chloride locking out your potassium, and um, you know, you think you might need to add more potassium, but chances are these days, if you're using a, a fertilizer geared for cannabis, there's plenty of potassium. So that's just a, a case in point that you need to always not only monitor, um, you know, what the recommended EC values are that each nutrient company recommends, but check out the actual nutrition content of the blend that you're using before you, um, before you implement it into your grow. Best fixture to use for mothers and veg. Um, so it really depends on your flavor. So we have uh, the flagship series, which is really great. And that spring setting is, is amazing as far as growing moms and veg plants. Um, but beyond that, we have the FOS F1V that can be fixed for veg. And it's astounding for, for moms and, and veg plants. It's, uh, it's full of more, more of that blue fraction than um, some of our other fixed spectrum options. All right, we got Jeff asking, do you share morphology impacts? Uh, from higher PPFD during veg, are these growth rates benefits as well under 900 PPFD and higher than you see? Could you repeat that? I apologize. So Jeff asked, do you share more impacts from higher PPFD during veg, are there benefits as well at 900 PPFD that you've seen? So can you talk on kind of, if you're using 900 PPFD in veg, what your target should be in flower, or how plants under higher intensities from veg to flower? For sure. Yeah, so uh, again, um, I recommend that if you're shooting for that 900 PPFD target in veg, that you're going to want to ramp up a lot more than that uh, in, in your flowering phase, but utilize the, the ramping function. If you have something like FOS or some sort of dimming technology, utilize that as you increase your light levels so as to, to not damage your crop. Um, but, you know, under 900 PPFD, if it's a an average or high light intensive cultivar, you can ramp it up slowly to your, you know, 13 to 1500 micromole, micromole range, or maybe experiment with more. Um, but I would argue that you need to take a slower ramping approach until you know the preferences that your cultivar uh, desires. We've got Doug K asking with the change in irrigation strategy. Okay. Um, Changing your irrigation strategy around defoliation days, do you lower your input EC as well with lower light intensity? Also, how many days do you typically keep the PPFD lower after defoliation? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, definitely I would say lower your concentration just a touch in tandem with total irrigation volume. Um, and I would give it a two to three day period to bounce back. Um, from what I've seen, it varies per the cultivar, but there's at least a, a 48 hour period where they're transpiring a lot less and they need those dimmed light levels, lower concentration and lower, lower total fertigation volume. So we've got Andrew Barnes asking, would I veg 
for a veg under these compared to HID? I have slower growth and light burn. Should I give them less hours per day? Can you go over some of the factors that might be contributing to that? So they're, they're getting light burn. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry? Yes. So he said, when I veg under these compared to HID, I have slower growth and light slower. burn. Should I give them less hours per day? Uh, I'm thinking not on less hours per day, yeah. Um, Could be too high of intensity at that stage, possibly. Likely high, too high of intensity at that stage, yeah. So we have Michael asking, any spectrum influence on terpene synthesis within the flow spectrum, not UV or added FR? That's a really good question. So um, as far as terpenes go, uh, there really should be a lot more studies conducted before we can definitively say one way or another. Um, overall though, recent studies have shown that um, certain terpenes will have those beneficial increases um, with UV exposure, but most of them don't. Um, so it's, it's one of those uh, things where you know you have a little give and take with UV, um, but as far as the faux spectrum, like I mentioned previously, studies have shown that just simply increasing intensity uh, with many cultivars is going to boost uh, your terpene levels. We've got Jasmine asking, can a beginner grower use faux for indoor personal grows? Absolutely, yeah. We have awesome fixture options, whether it's the fancier end of the spectrum in the Aries uh, with spectral control and adjustable light bars to customize your footprint or the Pisces we're going to release soon. I will say the Pisces is a bit bigger of a fixture, so you will likely shoot for a 5x5 five five tent if you're going to utilize that one, but we have a few different options for the home grower. Awesome. We've got Jose asking, do you recommend the use of CO2 in the vegetative stage? Um, it can be minimally beneficial for sure. Um, where we find that it's more so beneficial is in flower, especially as you're pushing intensities beyond the 900 to 1000 micromole range. It'll really help to continue to drive photosynthesis, but at lower light intensities, um, major CO2 supplementation isn't, isn't too necessary. Got problem asking, do you have some recommendations about the autumn spectrum? and which wheat is better to switch over to. Yeah, totally. So autumn is really catered to ripening. Um, there's a lot of reds and far reds in the autumn. Um, so we typically, pending how long your, your cultivar takes to flower, we will suggest, you know, let's say nine week cultivar, for example, that you'll take the last three weeks to switch to autumn and start to promote the plant to ripen. All right, we've got Michael asking, is there any other tips on manipulating uh, the, spectrum uh, the spectrum for flowering. flowering. I, heard I heard spring, spring spectrum, spectrum can tighten bud formation, formation before harvest. harvest. Any, Any other tips? So I definitely have some recommendations on when to use the spectral settings as far as um, you know, using spring prior to harvest. Um, having more blues uh, and at a higher intensity can be akin to utilizing UV uh, in your light spectrum. So there are some benefits there as far as tightening uh, your flowers that late in the game, I would say no. Um, but for our spectral settings, our general recommendations are to start stretch in spring, just to mitigate how hard they stretch in the stack nodes, uh, switch to summer mid flower uh, to further promote bulking, and then switch to autumn to finish and ripen. All right, we've got Juan asking, how high above the canopy is it recommended to have LED lights? Okay. So that's a really good question, and it's going to vary based upon the fixture that you choose. So some fixtures like the A3i, we have a further recommended hanging height or distance from the canopy. And then with fixtures like our F1V, I've personally grown them within a foot of the fixture with no problem. So it's really going to vary based upon which model you select. We've got Max asking, what are the best fixtures for greenhouse supplemental lighting? Okay. Um, pending your DLI, um, if you really just need a little bit of supplemental lighting, we have great fixtures in the Pleiades. It's a 320 watt greenhouse fixture. Um, we additionally have the Cobra models in 700 and 1000 watts. 
And then our killer is the O6i. If you really need uh, that bang with light intensity uh, and an awesome fixed spectrum at that, the O6i is the way to go there too. So we have a few different options for greenhouses. Right, we've got Michael asking, is there any difference within living soil systems? I know we kind of focused on EC and other things like that. Can you give a little bit of insight about using these fixtures in the living soil type system? For sure. So a lot of uh, our clients are pushing soluble nutrients and not using the, the living soil system. But if you were to be in that sort of setup, um, typically we see a little bit lower light intensity and a slightly decreased uh, feed EC. Um, just because, again, as the plants communicating with the microbiology, they're, they're going to express themselves as they want and draw up nutrients as they want as opposed to being force fed. So they typically do, will do better with slightly lowered feed ECs and slightly lower light intensities. Awesome. We've got Christopher asking, what should my PPFD and EC be from veg to flower? Okay. So again, I think that first there's the disclaimer that every cultivar is going to be different here. I try to categorize them into three different categories of low light lovers, average, and high light lovers. So if you're on the low end of the spectrum, definitely cater to that. Uh, push your 300 to 450 micromoles in veg. Um, if you're average under LEDs, you can push those 600, uh, 600 to 700, 800 levels. And the highlight lovers, truly, they benefit so much from um, pushing the highlight intensities like 900. Now, that being said, a lot of our clients are pushing upwards of 1,200 to 1,500 micromoles in flour. And as far as per week, you'll have to just sort of dial that in with each cultivar. But if, you're, if you have one of our fixtures in our central control model, uh, slowly ramp intensity up to those levels uh, before you burn something because without, without taking it slow and understanding what each cultivar prefers, um, you're going to have nutritional issues. And that's whether or not you have data with this cultivar under HID systems because they're going to perform totally different under LEDs. Awesome. We've got Jesse asking, he's got two areas of the controller. Can you expand on the height adjustments through the growth stages? I believe I read that no height adjustments are required. Yeah, that's correct. No height adjustments are required for the areas, especially in a tent setup. Um, I believe it has a total PPF around 1,800 micromoles, something like that, which is plenty of light intensity for, um, for any stage of, of growth. We've got Bob asking, would you drop CO2 during the autumn stage? Absolutely, yeah. So CO2 is, just look at it as a... Um, an X factor or a part of photosynthesis. So light is the main driver of such. And if you're going for a ripening effect, you're typically going to switch to that autumn setting and you're going to taper your light intensity a little bit. So with that, you'll want to taper your CO2. If you don't, usually you can have excess CO2, which can result in extra ethylene in your room, which ripens your buds. And we don't want that, so. All right, Nate's asking. Do you find that plants require more of a specific nutrient with switching from HID to LED? Calcium? Question mark. What was your most ideal blend of nutrients and EC levels for flowering under LED? Can you go into how plant, plant sap analysis is a good tool to use when switching systems? Uh, really narrow that down between cultivars or different things. Absolutely. Plant sap analysis is so key as far as uh, analyzing nutrition under any system. So. Um, you can really use it as a tool to figure out the answer to what you're saying. Um, as far as EC values that are optimal in flower, I've always had great success between a 2.5 and a 3. I haven't pushed too, too much past a 3, maybe a 3.2, but we have plenty of people being successful with higher ECs as well. It's just all about balancing your irrigation strategy so as to not drastically increase that substrate EC. Integration with other API systems. 
so like total grow control, grow weight, stuff like that. Can you go over how our lights integrate with those systems? Uh, with a grow link? Just with other alternative systems. Um, would you mind elaborating on that a little bit? Uh, just basically on a zero to 10 controller, how you can connect our lights to other systems. So we do connect to other systems to that API. Yeah, 100%, we do connect to other systems. Um, so uh, we integrate with a lot of the different systems like Trollmaster and some of the other guys. Yeah. All right, Joshua is asking, how long when you start flowering do you run spring setting? Or when do you switch to summer? So can you go over how some cultivators use spring until they see flower development if they want to keep it a little bit more stacked? Mm -hmm. And some switch directly into summer during flowering. For sure. So um, again, depends on your goals and what you want to do, but um, some cultivators are, are utilizing the spring setting through the stretch period to mitigate that plant height and stack nodes at a lower plant height. Um, others are just going straight into the summer. I always find that especially in an indoor setting that being able to control your plant height is, is huge. I've had way too many cultivars get stretchy and out of control on me without said control. So um, yeah. Definitely, it just depends on the goals of your facility, but you can go either way with it. Um, we've got Mo asking if these lights are waterproof and or detachable. So can you kind of go over some of the IP ratings of some of our fixtures and exactly what that means? Yeah, totally. So our flagship series um, has an ingress protection or IP rating of uh, 67, meaning it's extremely uh, protected against water and foreign materials entering the light itself. As far as uh, the light fixture coming apart into smaller pieces, not necessarily. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. Justin's yeah. asking, do you have a formula for your F1 feed line for how many BTUs are needed for X amount of fixture? So can you go over basically the, the wattage of the fixture, 2.41 BTUs per watt, and how that's a constant equation that we use? Yeah, so uh, 3.41 BTUs per watt is a, it's a constant formula that we're going to use to to figure that out. Um, I wouldn't say that there's like a specific formula for the F1B alone. Yeah. Uh, so in a hypothetical situation, if your input EC is 3.0 and you measure your output as 6 EC, according to Athena, that's correct, but do you know how high can the output be before having a problem? So he's talking about inflow EC, just substrate EC, and kind of the targets you're looking to achieve. Yeah, and um, what was like the, the last part of it? You just said what? Uh, do you know how, how you, high the output can be before yeah. having a problem? Perfect. So, as far as so, EC, where do we see burning? What ranges are we looking for? Is it between four to 10 in flower? Specifically, what do you see? Yeah, for sure. So uh, again, I think that's a, a cultivar dependent situation since we've seen plenty of cultivars go in excess of 10 EC in the substrate. So, but some, they, they can't take that much. So uh, again, data is huge here as far as your grow goes and figuring out what ECs are optimal for each strain. And then after that, you can subsequently go and start to group things in an optimal basis together so that you don't have to adjust too many parameters or take losses on various strains catering to, to one. We'll take a few more questions and then wrap this up. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so we've got Zariah asking, how much would you taper light intensity and CO2 during the later stages of the flower? Okay, so let's say you hit a target PPFD of 1500. I would want to taper that back down to around 12 uh, by the finish and uh, same for your PPMs, uh, drop it to about 11 to 1200 um, as those need to work together to photosynthesize. And if it's the end of the cycle and that's sort of slowing down, then it only makes sense to drop the CO2 as well with the light. We've got David asking, in my grow situation, I have a veg in a flower room. Would I be better off with a light in my flower room that was just for flower or would a light that does all spectrums be better? So can you go over that? We have lights where you can veg in place, and we also have lights where you can use a fixed spectrum for vegetative and flower growth. So it kind of depends on the setup. So. Yeah, it definitely will depend on your setup and budget, but 
We have lights that do it all. Our A3i, Scorpio, and Aries all have spectral tuning capabilities. Um, and that's really great for vegging in place and just finishing a cycle in one room. Uh, but we also have really good fixed spectrum options, like our, our F1V is a killer. We could fix that for a vegetative spectrum with more blue fraction, and then we can also fix it for flower. Okay. We'll go ahead and take our last question, and then once we have an answer, we'll try to get back to you. Okay. For sure. So Ramses is asking, do I have to use more magnesium under LED lights? Can you go over some of the things we've seen with two-part systems, having too much potassium, and then possibly locking out magnesium, that being the case for additional magnesium? Yeah, totally. So we see it quite often in cannabis cultivation and as well uh, at the sap analysis level that we have excess potassium and that really uh, having a, a relationship with magnesium is going to often lock it out, which is the reason that we see magnesium deficiencies in flour. And it, it doesn't make logical sense to those feeding because your feed has plenty of magnesium, but if you're able to take sap analysis and look at things from um, an analytical perspective, then you're able to see, oh, well, it's clear that my potassium was the cause of this magnesium lockout. So um, I would definitely say, uh, you know, sap analysis is key to answering your questions. Whenever uh, you have these nutritional issues, it's the first step that cultivators should take. Shout out to Scott Wallace. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Scott. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate everybody for joining. Um, if we didn't answer your questions, please feel free to send me uh, your questions and I can answer them directly at anthony at um, But until next time, we really appreciate you joining. You guys have a good one.